Hello, welcome to the talk, uh, Scaling Prometheus, how we got some Thanos into Cortex. Uh, in this talk, uh, we're going to show Cortex and specifically uh, a new storage engine uh, we have built uh, into Cortex, uh, leveraging on Thanos. Before that, let me do a quick introduction about Cortex. Cortex is a distributed time series database built on top of Prometheus. Uh, Cortex is horizontally scalable and highly available and offer a durable long-term storage for your time series data. Um, Cortex uh, supports uh, multi-tenancy and the typical use case uh, is to have a global view across multiple Prometheus servers. Over the years, Cortex uh, also um, spent uh, a lot of effort in order to optimize the read path and today, Cortex uh, offers uh, uh, very good uh, uh, query performances. Cortex uh, is a CNCF uh, sandbox project, and uh, we are currently in the process uh, of uh, moving to incubation. Uh, the typical use case of Cortex uh, is that you have uh, multiple Prometheus servers, uh, usually in, configured in HA pairs, and you configure Prometheus to remote write uh, to a central a Cortex cluster where all your time series are written. And then you configure Grafana or the querying tool of your choice to query back this matrix from Cortex. Uh, Cortex internally vendor Prometheus uh, and uh, we use the same exact Prometheus uh, uh, PromQL engine. Um, this guarantees 100% compatibility uh, on your queries. Um, if you look at the microservices uh, architecture of Cortex. Uh, Cortex is composed by different services uh, um, interacting to together. Different services which you can uh, independently horizontally scale up and down. On the right path, uh, you have uh, Prometheus configured to remote write uh, to the distributor. And the distributor is uh, the ingress for the right path and is responsible to shard and replicate your series across a pool of ingesters. The ingesters keep the received series samples in memory and periodically flush their series to the long-term storage. Under the hood, the long-term storage is actually composed by two different data stores, an object store and an index store. The object store is like GCS or S3, is uh, used to store chunks uh, of compressed uh, um, timestamp value pairs, which we call chunks. And the index store, uh, like Bigtable or DynamoDB or Cassandra, um, is used uh, to store an inverted index, uh, which we use to look up the chunks uh, by the label, the query um, label matchers uh, and the query time, time range. On the read path, uh, you configure Grafana or your querying tool um, to send uh, the, um, the query request to the query front end, uh, which is the ingress uh, for the read path uh, in a Cortex cluster. Uh, the query front end, uh, um, the main purpose of the query front end uh, is to offer uh, result caching and uh, also um, employs some optimization techniques, uh, which uh, we will see in details later on. Uh, which allows to parallelize the query execution across multiple query nodes. So the query or a splitted query uh, that can be splitted by the query front end is ex executed by a pool of queries, which will fetch the most recent samples from the ingesters and all their data from the long-term storage, and then will run the PromQL engine on top of this. Now, this... Um, slide shows you uh, the microservices architecture, but you are not required to deploy Cortex in microservices architecture because Cortex actually support uh, a second operational mode, which is the single binary mode. And it's the easiest way to deploy a Cortex cluster today. So when you deploy Cortex in single binary mode, um, Cortex uh, is running as a single binary with a single configuration. Uh, if you deploy, um, inside Kubernetes, it will just be um, a single deployment. And uh, what we actually do is that internally within one single Cortex process, 
um, we run all the microservices, all the Cortex microservices. So the microservices are hidden to you when you deploy Cortex in single binary mode, but you can still um, horizontally scale um, Cortex running multiple replicas uh, of the single binary. And all the Cortex properties uh, like uh, horizontal scalability and high availability or query performances uh, are preserved uh, in single binary mode as well. Uh, this architecture um, over the time proved to work and scale very well. Um, we have seen uh, um, Cortex clusters uh, ranging from few tens to 100 million active series. And uh, uh, in the typical use case, uh, um, we see the 99.5 percentile query latency below uh, 2.5 seconds. However, uh, for many users, uh, requiring both an object store and an index store uh, introduce extra operational complexity. And if you run in a cloud like Bigtable or DynamoDB, also extra costs to run a Cortex cluster. So almost a year ago, we started brainstorming on the idea to remove the index store at all. Uh, the idea was, well, are we able to remove the index store dependency at all and store all the data only in the object store? Um, and that's how the Cortex blocks storage um, started. And specifically, uh, the Cortex block storage is an alternative uh, storage engine um, currently in the experimental phase uh, we support in Cortex. So you can deploy Cortex uh, with the uh, chunk storage, which is the architecture I just showed to you, or uh, you can deploy Cortex using the new um, and experimental uh, block storage. In this talk, we are going to cover how the block storage work under the hood. Hello everyone, uh, my name is Marco. I'm a software engineer at Grafana Labs. I'm a Cortex maintainer, and uh, I recently joined uh, Tynos Maintainers as well. Hi, I'm Thor Hansen. I'm a software engineer at HashiCorp. I got involved with Cortex in my previous role, where we served metrics and alerts for many customers. We were a small team and needed the scalability of Cortex, as well as the multi-tenancy, but didn't want to have to manage a separate index store, which is where this all started for me. So the main idea behind the block storage solution is to open up a Prometheus TSDB per tenant per ingester and upload these blocks to long-term storage. A TSDB block both contains the chunks of compressed data points and importantly also contains the index. And the entire block can easily be stored in an object store, basically removing the need to run a dedicated index store. But isn't this what Thanos was already doing? So instead of trying to reinvent the wheel, we can leverage the lessons learned from Thanos and grow on that. So I built the initial version of this idea. It would open a TSDB for each tenant on every ingester to store incoming writes. These TSDBs would periodically write a block to the ingester's local disk under a tenant prefix directory. Ingesters started a Thanos shipper per tenant to scan each of these TSDBs directories and upload newly written blocks to long-term storage. Ingesters would now serve queries straight from the local TSDB. Ingester TSDBs had a given retention period where blocks that had been shipped to storage but exceeded the retention period were deleted from local storage. It also modified the querier to use Thanos querier, which would download and cache the index and blocks found in long-term storage for each tenant prefix. Querier could then serve requests by either using the cache blocks or downloading blocks on demand from block storage. I'd like to give special thanks to Peter and Ganesh for their contributions to this community effort, as well as others who put in time and effort into making this idea a real solution. It took us nine more months of hard work to stabilize and scale out the block storage. We introduced two new Cortex services, the Compactor and Store Gateway. We added three layers of caching, index, chunks, and metadata. We implemented most of the existing Cortex features like rate limits and operational tooling and we've made many optimizations and bug fixes. Today, the Cortex block storage is still marked experimental, but at Grafana Labs, they're already running it at scale in a few of their clusters, and we expect to mark this feature as stable soon. So let me show you the current state. The Cortex architecture doesn't change much between the original chunk storage, 
which we'll still continue to support, and the new block storage. Writes still are distributed and replicated to ingesters, and then uploaded to object storage. Reads still go through the queries, which read from the ingesters to get recent metrics. The bigger changes come with two additions to querying from long-term storage. We added the store gateway and the compactor. Store gateway is responsible for the discovery of newly uploaded blocks. It will scan for newly uploaded blocks and download the index in each block and cache them locally. With these stored indices, it acts as a queryable interface from long-term storage and can fetch query blocks on demand. The compactor is responsible for reducing the number of blocks in long-term storage by combining and deduplicating blocks. It will periodically scan a tenant's prefix and object storage to locate blocks that are eligible for compaction using the Thanos file name format to determine overlap. It will download the compaction candidate blocks and create a new larger block out of the data. It will then upload that new block and mark the compacted blocks for deletion. The compactor and store gateway leverage the same sharding ring code that Cortex ingesters use to distribute tenants. So as their scale increases, the number of tenants they need to perform work on decreases. However, at this time, there's still no way to scale compaction for a single tenant. All of these new are new to Cortex, but are actually borrowed from Thanos. They've been updated to support multi-tenancy and sharding for horizontal scalability. The ingester shipping to long-term storage is based on Thanos Shipper. The store gateway querying blocks from long-term storage is based on Thanos Bucket Store. And the compactor is based on Thanos Compactor. So here's a closer look at the right path. A given metric is replicated to multiple ingesters for each user. So you can see here, the same metric is written to three separate blocks and three separate ingesters. These blocks are written to an ingester's local storage every two hours and a long running process called the shipper will discover newly written blocks and upload them to long-term storage. This poses an interesting scaling problem in regards to how many blocks are created. The number of blocks grows quickly with the number of tenants a cluster has. With 1,000 tenants and a small scale of 50 ingesters, we'll be creating 600,000 blocks a day, which equates to 200 million blocks a year. Since we replicate data in ingesters, typically recommended to be 3x, the issue is we're storing a large number of identical metrics in storage when we really only need to be storing a single copy of each data point in storage. The solution is the compactor that was mentioned earlier, which performs both horizontal compaction, which creates fewer larger blocks over a greater time period than just the two hours that was uploaded, as well as vertical compaction, which deduplicates the overlapping blocks from the ingester replication. This results in one block per day per tenant when we originally had 12 times the number of ingesters per tenant. And importantly, the compactor can horizontally scale to support a large number of tenants. Now the previous solution reduces the footprint after compaction in the object storage, but we are still shipping one block per ingester per tenant every two hours, as well as opening a TSDB on every ingester for every tenant, which meant the memory footprint did not scale with the number of nodes. The solution was shuffle sharding, where for any given tenant, that user's blocks would only end up on a subset of ingesters. So for example, tenants may be shuffle sharded to four ingesters. So for every user, only four blocks per tenant per two hours are uploaded to object storage. And each tenant uses a static amount of memory overhead for the TSDBs. This also has the benefit that the compactor no longer needs to perform as much work compacting blocks as we've reduced the number of blocks that are uploaded. Here's an example of write performance, courtesy of Grafana Labs and the environment they're running. We can see there's still a very low 99th percentile latencies with two and a half million samples per second ingested. So uh, we have seen that uh, we can efficiently um, ingest a large amount of samples per second with a pretty low latency. But the real question is, how do we query back this data? Um, one, in, in one of our clusters we, we are running at Grafana Labs, uh, we have a tenant with 30 million active series running on the block storage, um, which means uh, that we uh, store about 200 gigabytes uh, of uh, blocks per day after compaction. Uh, if you project this uh, to one year retention, um, it, it means that uh, we need to be ready to query 
back this data uh, about uh, across a, um, a storage of about 70 terabytes. Uh, to understand how the, the read path work uh, for the block storage, uh, we have to do a little step back um, and focusing on the query front end, which is the ingress uh, on the read path. Now, as previously mentioned, uh, the query front end provides two main features, query execution parallelization and result caching. The basic form of the query execution parallelization is based on uh, time splitting. When the query front end receive a query spanning over a large time range, a time range which cover more than one day, uh, the query front end split this query into multiple queries, each one covering one single day, aligning the timestamp of the splitted query to midnight UTC. So if we here receive a query spanning over the last three days, uh, this query will be actually executed, uh, uh, will be actually split into three different queries. Each query will cover a different day, and thus three splitted queries will be executed concurrently by the queries, and their results will be then merged by the query front end before sending back the response to Grafana or your querying tool. Now, this means that uh, in most of the cases, um, internally, a single query executed by the query will cover only one day. And that's the primary reason why, by default, we compact blocks uh, up to one day period. And uh, doing uh, tests uh, in our clusters, uh, we have seen that uh, this uh, allows for a better parallelization uh, when you run queries over a large time range. The querier then execute this uh, one day query. Now the querier um, periodically discover new blocks uploaded to the storage running a scan over the bucket. And it keeps in memory a map of all the known blocks in the storage. For each block, we just need few information, which is the tenant ID, the block ID, and the minimum and maximum timestamp of samples within the specific block. And then when the querier receive a query, uh, it look for all the block IDs containing at least one sample uh, within the query start and end time. And based on the filtered block IDs, it compute the set of store gateways that should be queried in order to query back uh, the data from those blocks. The querier will fetch the most recent data which has not been flushed to the storage yet from the ingesters, and we que will query the blocks stored in the object store through the store gateways. Blocks are sharded and optionally replicated across the store gateways. This means that we can horizontally shard uh, the blocks across the pool of store gateways. And for each block belonging to the shard of one specific store gateway, the store gateway loads the index header. The index header is a small subset of the entire block index. In, in our clusters, we see that the index header is in the order of 2% of the index, so it's a little part of the index. And it's used to speed up um, the index lookup uh, at query time. The querier query the blocks through the minimum set of store gateways holding the required blocks. So when the querier receive a query, the querier compute the list of block ideas which should be queried, and then look up the hash ring which we use uh, um, to sh uh, as the baseline uh, technology to implement the sharding and the replication uh, to find the minimum set of store gateways holding uh, the blocks that needs to be queried. And concurrently, query those blocks through the store gateways. If we look inside a single store gateway, the store gateway always download, uh, fully download to the local disk and then hem up in memory, the index header of each block belonging um, to the shard of the specific store gateway. 
But the entire index or the chunks files, which are even bigger, have never entirely downloaded um, to, the, to the store gateway. The, how the system works, which has been inherited by Thanos, is that uh, uh, the full index and the chunks are lazily fetched at query time uh, through multiple get byte range requests. So we load the minimum data as possible when we at query time. If we look at a single query received in the store gateway, the typical query contains four information. The set of series label matchers um, for which uh, the samples should be fetched, a start and an end timestamp, and the list of block IDs which has been previously computed by the query. And then the store gateway will run a local lookup on the symbols and posting of the table which are done through the previously downloaded index header. And the result of this lookup uh, is actually the input for the remote lookup. And so the store gateway will fetch the postings and the series, and then from there, uh, the chunks, which are the segments of compressed timestamp value pairs of the samples for the matching series. This remote lookup is done through get byte range request. Now, um, we actually want to lower as much as possible the calls to the object store, both because of performance reasons and also because of costs. Given most of the object store pricing um, is based on a mix of data stored in terms of gigabyte and number of API calls you run. And we have introduced uh, three layers of caching, the metadata cache, the index cache, and the chunks cache. The metadata cache is used by the blocks discovery mechanism, which is running both inside the query and the store gateway. While the index cache and the chunks cache is only used by the store gateway. The index cache is a caching layer in front of the posting and series lookup, and the chunks cache is a uh, a cache in front of uh, uh, the fetching of the chunks containing the compressed samples. Since the chunks files are up to 512 megabytes each, we, don't nev we never download, we never fully download um, the entire object or the entire file, and we never fully cache uh, a single entry with uh, 512 megabytes. But what we do is we do a sub-object caching uh, aligning the offset to 16 kilobyte. Caching uh, is not mandatory, uh, so it's an optional component, uh, but it's, it's recommended in production. Last but not the least, uh, um, we have done this work uh, as a necessity we had in Cortex, but we backported all those improvements to Thanos as well. At Grafana Labs, we are currently running a uh, few clusters. And uh, in one of those clusters, uh, which is a, a staging cluster, um, we have done, uh, uh, we have done um, an atypical setup. So we are running two identical clusters since a few months. By identical, I mean identical in terms of uh, version of Cortex that we run and uh, um, scale, same number of Cortex nodes ingesting the same exact series, roughly 10, mega, 10 million active series. And then we have introduced a proxy, uh, which is called query T and we open sourced as well, which mirror every single query we do receive to both clusters. And we make the two backend clusters, one running the block storage and another one running the chunk storage compete in terms of performances. What we have seen, uh, is that the block storage performances are pretty good and comparable uh, with the chunk storage for most of the use cases. Uh, we still have uh, some spikes uh, in the P99 uh, in the block storage, um, mainly due to cold, cold caches. Um, but the, the progress uh, we have made and measured uh, this way uh, over the past uh, few months uh, um, is pretty good. 
And uh, I personally believe we are uh, on a good track uh, to run the block storage with compatible performances uh, compared to the, to the chunk storage. Now the question here is, what's next? Um, so if you if you are running the block storage, the experimental block storage today, um, or you are interested into giving it a try, uh, please be aware um, we are very close to market stable. Um, it's something we expect will happen uh, this quarter. We are currently working on many things, uh, but uh, to mention uh, um, the most important probably, we are continuously working to improve the query performances. Uh, this is an endless work um, and uh, we are doing many iterations over it. Uh, we have several ideas. Uh, we still want to, to experiment and that they may lend into upstream changes. Um, but yeah, keep in mind, we are um, spending a lot of time on continuously improving performances. We also want to productionize uh, the shuffle sharding. Um, and basically we want to be able to scale a cortex cluster to um, any size of tenants, under tenants, thousand tenants, tens, thousand tenants. Um, and we believe that shuffle sharding uh, is the way to go in this direction. And also in the tenants community, um, we recently started the work to introduce the support for deletions, um, being able to selectively delete uh, uh, series and time series data um, from Thanos. Um, we are very interested uh, in deletions as well uh, in the Cortex community. And uh, we will work closely uh, with the Thanos community to make it happen and introduce the support for deletions uh, in the Cortex block storage as well. So thank you very much for joining this talk. Um, now there will be a QA session, but please don't forget to check out the CNCF schedule. Um, there are a couple of Cortex rooms and booth hours. So please check out the schedule and join us if you have any questions.